Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we're all just trying to survive in a rough world. And we're back, Farm, and I have to say it was a uh, rough week. I'm still upset with you and considering whether or not I should forgive you. And we'll have this And conver- wait a minute, and vice versa. And we'll have this conversation but I right here you. on Surviving the Survivor. And I'll tell the audience why. So they, people think that this is shtick, but it's not. Romela and I have not been talking for a couple of days. And Unusual, I'll tell you why. Because we talk 10 times a day. I uh, wrote something called Joel's Simple Life Plan. I reached rock bottom. Was Joel, upset can in I my just say something? was upset Joel, about the way things are, are going. Doing no, we are doing it because I want to let them know. I, I want to let them know what's going on. So I come up we with this won't entire. Have time for the three questions. I come. Yes, we will. We have plenty of time. I come up with this entire plan, present it to Carmela X Y Z about what I want to do and how I want to do it. The plan lasts exactly three hours. I get a call from Carmela. And everything in the plan, she just completely ignores and starts yelling, as she always does. And she turns the pressure screws, turns the screws like a vice on my head. And I just cannot take it anymore. Do you understand that? Let me tell you what happened. He said that he's going to the I doctor. Have, listen and to me. To, listen I, to this. For, I'll now let you speak I, after. I want to say one thing. I have at least five full-time jobs. I have three children. I have two dogs. And I have a wife. And I cannot take any more pressure. And not three hours after I present to you the way I'm going to do things in my head to clear some of that Joel. pressure. Imagine walking around with a weighted blanket. That is how I exist in my life. Not three hours passes and you are calling and upending my plan and just creating pressure where there doesn't need to be any. Let me tell you what happened. He calls me up that he's going at eight o'clock to get a knee, first time a knee, uh, uh, an injection in his knee at 8 a.m. Now he starts to work at 2 p.m., but he cancels his work for that day. I had taken the day three weeks prior. But I'm let not me finish. S- let me finish. So he says to me, oh, he says, the insurance didn't work out. I went all the way there at, three o- at 8 o'clock and nothing happened. Uh, I said, oh, then you're going to work. And he says, you are putting pressure on me. I was planning to work on the other projects today. I already had the day off. And, and an avalanche of fury. Most fury. grown men, 52, <laughs> aren't under the thumb of their mother. But, but sad, you let yourself be. Sadly. I, you even say to me, I wasn't under the thumb of my mother. I'm just telling you on the record here on Surviving the Survivor. Oh, we have it now on record. I cannot. People will really love I this session. I cannot. It will be take better than William Steele. The pressure anymore. And I, I, I got cannot. Take I got the pressure it. Because any, if I say anymore. to you, oh, you are not going to work considering that you did not get the injection on, on your knee, and, and then you went ballistic. Carmel, uh, if you keep the pressure on me, I'll never go to work again. I'll be in a rubber room in a hospital. Bobbing back and forth okay. in the corner, naked, we, salivating think, on myself. I think we got the point. You mentioned. I know. I learned something. You mentioned. I can only I said say we yes, have, sir. Yes, sir. I said we yes, have it. Sir. We have yes, it on sir. video now. And you know who else? We've got a guest coming up right after this break named William Steele. And he's got stuff on video, too, that he's seen. And it has to do with Jeffrey Epstein. That's name and names. And Shalane Maxwell. I name Joel Waldman. One of the most inter- interesting interviews you will hear in all the world of media, coming up next on The Main Schmooze. Do you want to help my son? His company, Content Partners Media, specializes in brand video and content creation for innovative companies and others. Please go to www.contentpartnersmedia.com and hire him. I repeat, Please go to www.contentpartnersmedia.com.
Welcome back to Surviving the Survivor. It's time now for the main schmooze. So, Carm, a few weeks ago, we had on Chris Hansen of Dateline fame. And the first question I asked him, did Jeffrey Epstein commit suicide or was he murdered? And I tend to definitely believe the latter. And that is a lingering question uh, among the media elites in this country, those who care, those who are talking. Are you really taking a Ricola out of your mouth and putting it into a wrapper? on YouTube in the middle of our main schmooze. Did that just happen or am I imagining this? What do you want me to swallow it all? I'm imagining this and also speak into your microphone, Carmela. And please do not embarrass me again. Oh my so, God, so, today he's bad. So listen, we have an incredible guest on. I say this every week and the reason I say that every week is because I book the best guests in America. We have William Steele on and uh, William, how are you? I'm fine. How are you guys? Excellent. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for uh, joining us. Let me tell the audience who William Steele is. He is the author of the popular new book, Jelaine, Sensational and Impure, you know, as in Jelaine Maxwell, as in Jeffrey Epstein's sidekick. It's an intimate look at what was going on behind the proverbial curtain in the lives of Jeffrey Epstein and Jelaine Maxwell. And this comes from an insider. William Steele himself was a casualty of abuse at the hands of Jelaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. He rips the phony masks, masks of civility off the nefarious duo, and he names names. Carm, that's been a theme of our show the last few weeks. We had a professor who uh, uncovered and unmasked anti-Semitic uh, teachers and professors at elite universities. We named names. Last year, week, we had Fred Guttenberg on, whose daughter was killed in the Parkland shooting, and he named names of people who are not helpful, uh, helpful when it comes to uh, reforming what's going on uh, with, with the gun violence in this country. And today, we continue that trend in naming names. Now, William Steele is a very fascinating background. This is the stuff that intrigues me. He's a former jewel and art thief who spent years in prison. He is now reformed. He is a crime victim's advocate, a true crime author, soon to be a big time TV personality, which I'll tell us about as much as he can, and a social media king who I may hire to do social media for our, our podcast because I seem to be failing at that miserably. Bill or William, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me. We're grateful to be on. So let's start here. How did you wind up? incarcerated uh what, what's this about the jewel thievery well years ago i always wanted to be a mission impossible type guy guy that could do anything uh you know all for the greater good and uh my i got some training i learned how to be a locksmith i went to a school in new york city i'm from brooklyn i went to a school in manhattan that was the new york school of locksmithing uh, and i studied that face and alarms and i perverted those skills um, mostly the result of a, a cocaine addiction I developed back in the eighties. And I, so I went through that battle. I don't drink or you know, do anything else, but I did have a cocaine problem. And so I took those skills and put them to bad use. And I was, you know, very prolific in what I was doing, uh, committing burglaries all across South Florida, California, Vegas, New York. So I was very, uh, two things acquainted two with that life and the negative consequences that stem out of it. All the, Millions that I made were not worth the consequences and the loss of all William. that time and family members. Um, William, I served had, over 18 years in prison for nonviolent offense. We we had uh, we uh, very recently we had a very nice gentleman who happened to be a cocaine. Uh, um, what was his shipper? Or, a cocaine distributor. And please, distributor. Carmela, you cannot look away from the microphone. You need to speak into the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, but the mic Broadcasting am, 101. Am, Broadcasting is, 101. It's very, 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 very annoying this week. If you were <laughs> like this the whole time, this would be our last one. So, and your point, do you think that William Steele knew Luis Navia? So we had a guest on. His name was Lu Luis Navia. 
and he was high up in the Colombia drug cartel. He was a cocaine distributor. Spent he got caught after many years, like thirty years, and he spent five years in federal prison. So that's a. I knew Jorge Ayala, one of the top uh, people, uh, co- one of the original cocaine cowboys. Oh wow! I knew him pretty well. I used to traffic cocaine and and guns also. Interesting. Um. So, two things come to mind. Number one. Instead of my parents pushing me into a liberal arts university, I went to Brandeis University, which was a huge waste of time and money. I, sh- I should have gone to locksmithing school. I would have had I, – I probably would have had a legitimate business. I had to pay a locksmith about 500 bucks a few weeks back when I it's locked myself. It's not a joke. It's not a joke. You don't have to be a thief to make a very good living as a locksmith today. Maybe in those days, no, but today locksmiths are – very important. The two things I should have become are a plumber and or a locksmith. But William, let me ask you this. When you went to locksmithing school, was it your intent in your in your no. mind prior to going that you're going to use this for untoward practices to, to break into things? Or you just developed a skill and then had the addiction and then got into that? Not necessarily my intent, although at that time in my life, I was open to doing whatever it took to make you know, money, it was the eighties. It was uh, everything goes. I was already, um, you know, using cocaine in a very minimal way. So I was kind of open to whatever came up and I graduated top of my class and became very good at what I did. And how was, uh, how was life in Brooklyn growing up? What's that? We're from Jersey. What section of Brooklyn? I'm from like uh, Bensonhurst, uh, Sheepshead Bay area. Some people don't know it's sandwiched between it's called Gravesend. Uh huh. So it's right between the two. Um, beautiful. I have, I grew up in a beautiful neighborhood of Brooklyn. Um, we have one of the biggest pieces of property in that area. Um, uh, a few minutes from Brighton beach. Uh-huh. It's nice. It was a very quiet one way street with a gigantic uh, single family house, giant backyard. Um, it was almost like a house in the country in the middle of Brooklyn. So the uh, problem was my mother was mentally ill and because of all the family drama that unfolded with that. And, uh, my, my friend, Sammy, um, got killed in a car accident and I self-medicated with more cocaine and I got very, very addicted after family passed away. Um, you know, he was Jewish as well. And you know, that, uh, by the time I found out about it, he was already been buried right away. And mm-hmm. so I didn't get a chance to really pay respect. Family was sitting shiver. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how this started. So I had that struggle with cocaine throughout the eighties and early nineties. And then I paid a dear price. I, was doing what I was doing. I was making a lot of money, but again, none of it's worth it. And I, it's more rewarding for me now with my fiance, uh, Dr. Mary Bass. She's a forensic accountant and she's also a really strong victim advocate. And she supports me. Um, before I was getting out of prison last year, um, Tom Madden, who is a dear friend of mine, he was the former vice president of NBC. He now owns as media group, uh, public relations from the Boca Raton. Yeah. She came to him for PR for an incarcerated client in California. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned me and introduced us and he actually was matchmaker. Tom yeah. Madden introduced Mary and I and now we're engaged. We're getting married soon. I was so, shocked to learn that Tom Madden is not Jewish. He lives in Boca. He was the number two guy at NBC and he, uh, everything about him, <laughs> he reminds me of a, he's a great guy. He reminds me of a, a Jewish grandfather, fatherly figure. And then I was blown away when right. I found out he's he, not. He, and he stays 28 years 28 years old forever. Yeah. He's got more energy <laughs> than, I've e- than I've ever had, but we digress. <laughs> so, you know, I think people are intrigued by uh, sort of this underground life. So just, and we'll get off, I'll get off of this and into Jelaine in a moment, but the, the jewelry thief part of this, how, what were you doing? Were you going to jewelry stores and, and like snatching stuff? Were you going in at night and unlocking stores? How, how, how is that going down? Um, primarily, I would do a little of everything, but not snatching. I would do very cased out jobs. <clears throat> uh, for example, I would work with a ro- lot of real estate agents at that time. Mm-hmm. And I would get into houses that were either open houses or, and I would case them. I would pose as uh, various celebrities' brothers. Uh, for a while, I was posing as Donna Karen's brother, and uh, I would say, my sister's doing a fashion show in Milan, and we're looking for a house in South Florida, you know, three to six million dollar range. So the realtors didn't do a lot of vetting, and they would take anybody into these homes, 
And because I also sold houses, you know, I kind of knew what to say to keep the salesman talking. And they would show me all every house. I mean, all they over, would, you know, they St. Would Andrews go, Country Club, they would like say, Intercoastal Waterway, Las Solas, all over the place. They would go and say, this painting, actually behind this painting, there is a wonderful safe. <laughs> it's a wonderful what? Safe. 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 Oh, behind the safe? <laughs> So it's funny, William, uh, I am lecturing my kids. I have three kids. I started very late, but I've got an eight, a six, a th almost three-year-old. And I'm now lecturing them daily on um, street smarts versus school smarts. And you definitely have street smarts. You were obviously raised in, uh, in Brooklyn and you learned the ways of the world very quickly. It's interesting because if you didn't take a criminal path, I bet you would have been super successful. You know how to talk to people. You know how to maneuver. I can tell already. So um, I might have to have you give my children some lessons in life. Life Lessons by William Steele. No problem. That, that's one of the things I want to really get into since my release from prison. Um, like speaking to groups, kids, uh, criminal justice groups. I've been invited to speak at universities and criminal justice, law classes. There was a lot of COVID restrictions, but all those requests are still starting to come in. So when did you finally get caught, if I could ask you, and how many how many yeah, years how? did you, and how? how did you get caught, when did you get caught, and how much time did you spend uh, behind bars? W which time? <laughs> <laughs> the last time. How about the last time? I, you know, back backing up to Brooklyn in my youth, I did actually attend Kingsborough Community College, and then I went into real estate, <laughs> buying and selling houses and uh, investments, and also for Century 21. Um I eventually was in South Florida and, uh, you know, I had a kind of a, a vindictive ex who told the police a lot of things that, you know, that I wouldn't have certainly told them <laughs> about what I was up to. And so it cascaded into that. I went in, I violated, I went in again. It totaled over 18 years. And in the middle of the last one, I actually escaped from prison, which was profiled on America's Most Wanted uh, website. They put, the, they put, and it was nothing fancy. I, I escaped from prison, I don't know, 50 times, if I'm not exaggerating, maybe 20 times. But the one time that I didn't come back is the one they were concerned about. I'd escape all the time and then come back. Screw Jelaine. Forget, we don't even want to talk about Jelaine. How did you escape from prison? I, it was nothing fancy. I was on work details. <laughs> I would either walk away, but they'd notice right away and they put a perimeter and they're hunting for you. And then, uh, I was pinned down in an apartment one time with the SWAT team at the door, banging, trying to get in. I knew they didn't know I was in the place. They didn't have consent to search. They didn't have a warrant. They had no exigent circumstances. I was a law clerk in prison. I just sat there quiet, waited for them to leave. You know, so they actually were on to me. They tracked me to a residence that I was at in the Fort St. Lucie when the, when the last one happened. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, so they only really charged me with the one where I didn't come back. So you're innovative. You're very innovative. I like this. So <laughs> on to the infamous Jeffrey Epstein and Jelaine Maxwell. I, right. Point blank. Was Jeffrey Epstein murdered or did he commit suicide? What's your take? I tend to think from all outward appearances and the fact that Gene Look has also been found hung in his cell a few days ago mm -hmm. in France. Um, I tend to think murder because they had so much, so many dealing with different intelligence agencies which I know a little bit about, but I'm not going to go into it because I'm not trying to turn up dead also. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> you get we, we all know the countries. I support I support Israel. You know, I support <laughs> the CIA and the Mossad. I love you guys. You know, but um, by the way, I don't necessarily <laughs> William, my my very good friend from childhood, I've known him since second grade. He was a guest on our podcast. You need to listen to all our old episodes. His name, he's out from the shadows. He spent 26 years um, as a covert op in the CIA all over the world. They taught him Arabic. He's a Greek kid, Greek and Jewish from Highland Park, New Jersey. And uh, he's out from the shadows. We had him on the show. He was actually hit with that Havana syndrome. So he's got really terrible vertigo and headaches wow. and he's getting treatment for it. But um, he'll appreciate that you're, uh, you're pro-CIA. I'll have a talk <laughs> with him and make sure that uh, they keep their hands off of you. Um, that was weird. Gee, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> but um, so I think I'm more concerned about MI6 right now. Who knows what they're up to? Yeah, with, uh, yeah. With, 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 with what, what I've seen, what, what I what I personally saw with Andrew, 
they're not going to be too happy about it when they get their hands on the video. All right, listen, I want I want to get into that, but first, before we get there, how how did you get? How are you related? Yeah, how did you get to meet Jeffrey and Jelaine? And I have to ask you this too. A lot of people are going to say, "Oh, this guy's a career criminal. Is he full of crap? How do we believe him?" So. If you can address all of those issues, how did you meet him and how, why do we believe you? It, it's it's well, irrelevant what they say. The main thing is that he has a Carmella, theory. Carmela, I am a reporter. Okay. It is my duty to ask these. <laughs> I, I seek the truth. Seek the William, truth. William, William, go ahead. Okay. What, what did she say? <laughs> <laughs> now, how did, now, how did you, so how did you meet Jeffrey Epstein and, and Jelaine? All right. Several years ago, without getting into a lot of detailed timelines, I met him when I was dealing with a fence in Palm Beach on Worth Avenue. It was a diamond salon. I was in there getting ready to do some business. I had a few hundred thousand dollars of stolen Excuse jewelry. Excuse me. Wait one second. Did you hear the word fence? Fence, yeah. Good, because I didn't think you heard it. What is that? What do you mean? You're talking. What? I, no, the fence is the person who sells it for you. Oh, I didn't, I didn't. You see, he didn't get it. I didn't get it. You Sorry. See, you see, I am right. When I didn't get it. You said you were talking with the fans, a guy who will buy it from you and uh, dispose of the, the things, right? Right. I didn't, right. How did you know that term? Because I know a lot more <laughs> than you do. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I had no idea what he was talking about. My mother knows Boy, me hey, well. Hey, you're supposed to know these things. Yeah, I didn't. Okay, so you were talking <laughs> to a fence. I love that. Never fence. heard that. I've never heard that in uh, my life. So, okay, so you're talking to this a, fence. A, a fence is somebody who would buy stolen things, no question asked. Wow, never heard of that. Okay, Thank you. Okay, get over Carmela, you're also not talking into the mic because you're like leaning. No, no, not that close over here. And this oh is embarrassing. Oh my God, now he wants to feel superior again. Okay, Go ahead. William, the floor is yours once again. Sorry, we are not going to interrupt, but. It bothered me that he didn't know such an important term. Go ahead. That's good. You raised a good boy. Very <laughs> sheltered. He, he doesn't need to know these things. <laughs> <laughs> From what I hear, you won an Emmy even. <laughs> yes, I did. I did. Um, okay. So I, I, what, what happened was I was at a fence, Palm Beach on Worth Avenue. There's a diamond salon, second floor. I don't want to na name the name of the owner because I don't know if he's still around or not, but not to be named right now. Uh, I go in there. He's at the other counter, who I now know to be Jeffrey Epstein. He's with a young girl. I don't know if you've read my book yet, but he's with a young girl that looks like a taxi driver error, Jodie Foster. Mm -hmm. Exactly like her. A 13-year-old. He's got his hand down the back of her pants in this salon. Mm -hmm. it's a very private place, but um, it was very inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So I just was incensed, but I was, at the time, having issues with the police. I had stolen jewelry on me, several hundred thousand dollars in jewelry. I had a gun in my bag with, with a silencer on it. Mm. And so I didn't need to make a scene here. I just needed to isolate him to get him alone. And I left right after he did and followed him down to a place called Taboo, which was a little restaurant on, on Worth Avenue, uh -huh. and confronted him in there. That story is played out in the book. But that's how I, that's how I met him. I confronted him about that. And I told him, I said, she doesn't, she, he, he claimed she was some kind of relative. I said, well, let me tell you something. And, and then she told me the same thing. I said, whatever the situation is, it was completely inappropriate. My buddy owns that place and there's video there. So you don't have to worry about the cops, but he should call the cops or I could call the cops. I said, but if I was her father, I'd put a bullet in your effing head right now. Mm -hmm. And I let, I actually had let him see the gun. And that's how I met Jeffrey Epstein. Wow. And I meet a lot of odd people in what I do in areas I, I operate in at that time mm -hmm. and i'm not afraid to talk to people because i like to network and get to meet people and find out who's who and what's what you know for, for other opportunities yeah so i was very very upfront about meeting people no matter the situation very, and that's how i met him very amiable guy so what was his reaction when you showed him this gun and said this to him he was very arrogant he didn't want to come over to speak to me until i confronted him and told him what it was about so i saw what you did in uh such and such long and I said, I, I, the best advice I can give, you know, give me this time. Came over to my table and we talked and he's very, uh, you know, very uh, scared, actually. And then did you come to have like a, a relationship with him and Jelaine after this? 
it was uh, what I'd refer to as a friendship of mutual usury because he had money and I had a bunch of jewelry and he would buy jewelry for the the model, you know, for the, the people that he had around him. Um, not a lot. He didn't need to buy it for me. He didn't need to buy stolen jewelry, of course. But I think he realized I had a little bit of maybe dirt on him mm-hmm. and, you know, that I can go back to my friend and my friend would give me the tapes if I asked for them at that time. But I also realized he had plenty of money and he actually lived there. And he could probably get those tapes too if he, if he talked to the guy. Um, but so he dealt with me, I think, out of fear. But fast forward years later, if you read the book, he very much got back at me. I was uh, by one of the bodyguards. I was blocked from leaving a room basically by a gigantic bodyguard or security detail that he had there. Uh-huh. So he really got back at me, you know, years later after, after that. This initial meeting where you see his hand down this 13 year old girl's pants in public, although it's a, in a salon. What year was that? Um, I, I don't want to lock in the timeline now. Roughly. Was, are um, we talking late, late, late nineties? Okay. So this is, this goes back a long way. And, oh, yeah. and in between this period of time, you got locked up again and then came out and would, would see him like, and that's how you started to, I would see, I would see them periodically. And he eventually, I forget exactly when introduced me to Gillen at the house. And that's how I met her. By the way, no one, we talked about Palm, this. At the Palm Beach house. Yes. We, oh, we talked about this before. Don't tell me to shut up on my, but see, you just got caught. You just got caught on the podcast doing what you do normally, but now you slipped. William Steele would never I, slip. I never said. William I Steele ne- would never, I never slip. Said shut up. You think I when don't... he's stealing jewelry, he s- slips? Yes, sometimes. No, he, he does, doesn't. Unfortunately. What was your question for William? Um, you're, you're one second. Yeah, when you said bodyguard, his body were they, were they his bodyguards? Presumably for him personally, and possibly for the house. I mean, you know, the guy was loaded, as we all know now. So he had he had security detail with him. All right. What's your theory? What's your theory? Where did he get all his money from? By blackmailing people, evidently. <laughs> you know. That's uh, what what I was able to determine. I think that's what the whole world's starting to see. When you first yeah. met him in this time period in the late nineties, did did you were you curious about what he did? Were, were were you did did you ask? Were you given an answer? Were you told what he did? Was, I, I think he said he was some kind of financial advisor. I called him out. He had he I detected a bit of a Brooklyn accent. We both being from Brooklyn, uh-huh. you know, we kind of connected at that level. Um, Again, all the thing I wanted was, you know, get my hands on on his money at that time. Um, at the house, I didn't see a, a lot going on, although there was women in and out of there all the time, including top, topless women at the pool. Some of them looked young, didn't necessarily look underage, but I didn't hang around there long because I wasn't sure what was going on. What what was exactly that, at, at, when you would go to visit him? What was the process, you know? from the sidewalk or the driveway to get into the home? Was there a process? Did you have to go through security? Well, they wanted to log my name down. Yeah, there was a process as a gate, you know, usually you call ahead or whatever. But I told them, you ever, don't ever log my name down. Um, I think they may have. I think one of the black books might have my name on it or something. One of the one of the household log books. Um, but he didn't really have my, my true name at the time. You know, anyway, what, so. you know what is interesting? And I want to hear your comment on this. On one hand, he was uh, he was fraternalizing with princes, presidents, uh, you know, very VIP people. But on the some on on another level, he was like on the same level as you, the the cocaine using, uh, breaking in guy. He was he was with you and with them. He was negotiating he between was never two really worlds. With me. I kept, I, I, he was never really like with me. I kept him at arm's length and just did my business and left. Yeah, and but what I mean is he was doing shady deals with you. Right. That's what I meant with you. Not necessarily right. going out to Cipriani for dinner, but still doing shady deals with you. But before my... I, I, thought you, I, thought, I thought you meant with me as in some kind of, you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> Hanging out with you. No, 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 no. What I mean no, he, is that he, he, he did shady deals of very low sophistication. Before my sweet 
82 year old mother told me to shut up. What I was going to say is that um, <laughs> we, before we got on the podcast, we were all talking because there's 45 million ways to pronounce her name. Gillane, Gislane, Gilane, Gilane. So you were calling her G, but then I call her Gillane, like starting like. No, but you do the American. Uh, she was And born how would you in, say it in French? Gillane huh? was born in France. And how right? would you say her name in Francais? En Francais? I would do a French J. Gilane. Gilane. <laughs> so. William, but, uh, but Gillen is good. So that's for uh, for our definition. When we talk about her, we will call her three different names: Gillen, Gillen, and Gillen. American. Beautiful. So, William, when did you first meet Gillen, or G, as you call her? Um, again, not locking in timelines. Okay. I'm still talking to some of the victim rights attorneys and the and law enforcement. Um, at the Palm Beach house, over the course of time, <laughs> he introduced me to her. And what was your initial impression or reaction of her? Arrogant, super arrogant uh, British woman. I just, I love the British people, uh, but she just rubbed me the wrong way. She tried to be very controlling. And I warned him. I said, you need to check, check her about speaking to me the way she is. Very condescending almost. Mm-hmm. You don't mess with Brooklyn. I, I love this guy, William. You don't mess with Brooklyn. <laughs> William and I are hanging after this podcast. You don't mess with Brooklyn for sure. We saw that on many, many, many occasions, including we my, also had my, remember- hus- my husband was born in Brooklyn. But the point is that you don't mess with Brooklyn but the British try. Shout she out was to raised as a Br- shout Britain. out to Tommy Russo. We also had a guest on this podcast, William, named Tom Russo. He was the youngest captain in the NYPD, and he really like he uh, towed the what the proverbial thin blue line. He was very close to leading a criminal life. He said he grew up in Brooklyn, rough childhood, but instead became uh, the youngest captain in NYPD history. Um, another podcast to check out, another episode to check out. But so back to Jelaine, I got to ask, even though my mother is in front of me, was she sexy when you first met her? Sexy woman? Um, well, uh, you know, I'm not really going to get into that. My fiance <laughs> is in with the ear side of us right now. <laughs> but I would say no, actually. <laughs> really? Really? Okay. No, I would say she was. I saw pictures. Okay. So this is interesting. Um, and William mentioned this. There's a guy named Jean-Luc Brunel. Yeah, he- that's. Sorry, we want this new one. Carmel, this is precisely what I meant by not interrupting every five seconds. I love you. That's an ethnic thing to interrupt. Jean-Luc Brunel. He died by suicide in his prison cell this past Saturday night. Today is February 23rd, so it was whatever, four days minus that. I'm not good with math. The 19th he died. Um, In December 2020, Brunel was charged with rape of minors over the age of 15, as though that's a good thing, rape of minors <laughs> over the right. age of 15, not, not 12. and sexual harassment, was sho- which shockingly is actually a crime in France. You wouldn't think it was. But so did, did you meet Jean-Luc Brunel? And what did, you, what did you make of this when you heard this news? I, I, I didn't know, realize who he was at the house, um, but I did see him there a few times. And uh, Jeffrey just would tell me that he was a modeling agent. William, who's I didn't the, realize that he was actually securing women or you know uh, minors and all this other things that were going on. Who's the most um, high? I don't know if you're. Are you allowed to say this? Who's the most high profile person you saw? Are you are you willing to say that or no? I named a few in the book. You'd have to buy the book to get. I am. I am. We, we both get, bought the to, book. To but, get the list of the names. I, I am, am not keeping it secret, but there's not enough time in this interview to go through them all. Can, but the highest profile, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Prince Andrew, and several others. And, and you saw them there? Oh, at the house? No, on video. On video? And wh- when you say on video, how are you getting access to this video? And it, this was video from that's his the home? Incident, that's the incident when he came in with that armed guard and basically put them on to let me know what he's been doing and what he's capable of. And the risk that I'm in um, to show me how powerful and, and how he had all these uh, influential influential pay- people basically trapped on video. Can you explain so, that? Can you can you re- 
trace this for me because I'm a little slow on the – I'm a nice Jewish boy from New Jersey that went to Brandeis. I should have gone to a locksmithing school, and I'm annoyed by this. But can you just uh, – It's also my fault. It is all so your everything fault. Everything is your It is all your fault. fault. Can you please uh, – all right, rewind on this. Tell me how did this part of this story go down? The, he, the security team approached you, and what, what's – I'm lost. No, I I eventually had a relationship with Elon. Mm -hmm. He tried to invite himself into that more than once. I was paranoid about cameras in the house. Mm -hmm. So anytime I would be with her, it would either be not there or it would be with the lights off, which probably doesn't make a difference. Um, and there was threesomes as well. He tried to invite himself into this, and I kept telling him, I don't know how, what I can actually say on this, but I was a very, very cocky Brooklyn guy at the time, and I said, if you set foot in this room, because he showed up at the door naked, mm -hmm. I said, if you set, uh, set foot in this room, I'm going to shoot you right in your... Got That's it. what I said. Yeah. So I was very cocky back then, and so he ended up, make a long story short, it's, it's outlined in the book, he came with a security guy to the room to basically confront me. And had me sit there while the assistant was putting different videos on the screen to show me that, you know, you got me in the beginning, but I'm telling you that, you know, I own you and I own all these people too. Interesting. There was a lot more said than that. And it was something he wanted me to do at the time, which is why he was sharing this with me. And it really terrified me. Actually, that was, I was in a very, very difficult situation. I was kind of not even going to be able to leave this room until I looked at some of what he was displaying. I'm glad my mommy's here with me. Carmel, did I, <laughs> did I uh, fully understand this? So is William having a sexual relationship with the Jelaine? Is that it, what he's telling us? Is that what you're telling us? It's, it's in the book. I wish I had time and to read this. And it's Are documented you? if they have, if they start releasing videos from the house, they um, should have me there. William? Um, well, I don't know at that time if, <clears throat> If the if um, Epstein and Gillen had a relationship, sexual relationship any longer, I don't. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. At that time, when you you two were busy, Gillen and you, I don't know if um, if he's if they were still in a sexual relationship, her and him. But it looks like they were. Looks like she was very busy. <laughs> she's very busy evidently very promiscuous and very um what was she very what, sick. The, very, what, what very, they, very very in, sick in the in the olden times they they called them nymphomaniacs we are, I'm we pretty are, sure I call I'm pretty sure I called her that in the book or one of the other interviews yes uh, so you called I'm her pretty certain I called her that in the book and the, in nymphomaniac other nymphomaniac right I'm just stunned right now. I well, some you know, it's very strange if a man. I live such a boring if, life. If a man has a million women, it's totally accepted. If a woman has a lot of, but I think also that she liked Epstein, and Epstein, Epstein kind of liked the young girls. But let you me ask right you something. And then, I am and going then. to say something terribly politically incorrect, and I didn't even. Uh, bring this up. Uh, I was talking to a friend who will remain unnamed, and she said, "It's horrible what happened. Horrible, horrible." But where were the mothers of all these young girls? Where were the mothers? Maybe they didn't have them. They were maybe, all they, maybe they were runaways. They were picked by. They were all orphans. William, what's your take no, on no, this? No, no, no. The, the the father of one worked at the. The father of the people of are the enamored by power, and and sm power is a drug like cocaine. Notice everybody, he cuts me off. Thank you. He cuts me off a lot. William, lately. what's your take, William? How, how, where, where were these? Where were these young girls' parents throughout all this? You're referring to the girls. Yes, the girls. Carmella or the girls. The girls. My take at the time was they were disadvantaged. However, that's come out later in the media that most of them were from various disadvantaged homes and trailer parks in West Palm. Not only that, there was women there, young 
girls that were supposedly models that didn't even speak English. I saw that myself. I saw okay, that on the video okay well. but let's say take the ones from West Palm. They still, most people have a mother. Maybe not everybody has a father, but most, where were their mothers? Uh, you know, I, I tell you a weird story about Joel when he was really little. There was a coach. Yeah, Barry Levine. You remember? Yes, I do. And this coach, you tell the story. Tell very briefly. Why am I the, telling the story? Because, because the mothers have to know what their children are doing. That's so I had a little league coach. I don't want to get into the story too deeply, but Carmela recognized something was amiss right away. He coached Little League, and then years later, it turned out that he was no, doing No, no, no. I told Joel, you never, ever, uh, he would invite the kids the main over red flag for is, pizza. He, after, the, after they won a game, he The would main red flag is that he recruited players. He was the only guy, and he had full, this was 1982. He would have full uniforms and cleats, and the main red flag was I was a horrible baseball player, and he recruited me onto his team, which made no sense. <laughs> oh, but, no. But, no, but the point is that as a mother, I had like a, a sixth sense. And then later, all these boys who were boys the same age with Joel came out, and they all said that he molested them. Yeah, he went to prison. He was he a went sick to bastard. prison. He went to prison. But but the parents have to be vigilant then and now. This is a commercial for parents. I think, I think society these days is much more open to talking about these things, and the kids are hearing it over what to be careful for. Whereas years ago, a lot of these subjects were tabooed, uh, taboo, and people weren't believed. Um, I have trouble with, with some of that myself. But I've been in contact with victim rights attorneys. They call me a victim. I say I'm not a victim. I put myself in this situation. I don't want to consider my, I was inspired by the victims of Maxwell and Epstein, completely inspired to finally tell my story. And I didn't even write this book and, because I came forward and I turned over videos and stuff I took out of the house. Nothing ever came of it. They were, everybody was covering for these people. So it took a lot for me to write this book considering people are dying and disappearing and having all kinds of blowback from coming forward. Um, so he's dead. She's convicted. And I said, now's the time to write this book. I've tried everything else. I've tried to report this. And where were the parents? I don't know. The, some of these women, and this is only from media accounts, I've heard some of them are from disadvantaged families. Their mothers were on drugs. They had medical problems. Um, I don't know these girls, really, I, other than what I've seen coming and going. I don't know their history. Well, you know, but yeah, they, yeah. They, preyed, they preyed on vulnerable people who needed money. And to them, you know, a few hundred dollars was a lot of money at the time. Yeah, but but I, all this I know because I have a master's in social work. Sorry to embarrass myself in front of you, but I have a master's in social work. And I know about disadvantage, and I don't want to do... If you had a degree in locksmithing, you'd actually know something. I don't want to do <laughs> victim blaming. You know, that's a horrible thing to blame the victim. The girls are the victims, and I just feel that they could have been... Uh, if I realize that they must have had parents who were distracted by other things in life and were not focused enough on what was going with these, uh, on with these girls, which doesn't take out or away anything from the people who abused them or took advantage of them. That's, okay. th that's another fact. Okay, so I'm, I'm not doing victim blaming. So right. exactly, exactly. We, we support the victims and yeah. There's there's nothing to be gained. I am now in touch with a few of the victims and with these attorneys and and uh, you know they've been through hell and I completely admire and it was inspired by them to really just tell the story. Uh, book two is coming out soon, and the fact that you have training as a social worker, you probably would talk some red flags to look for. A lot of these people don't have you know maybe the parents didn't have the education that you had or even maybe I had. So. When Epstein started to catch heat and things were closing in on him. What was your uh, reaction to that? I mean, did you, did you know his time was up? I was actually oblivious to most of it because I was incarcerated at the time. And when I did learn about it, I had a connection in the media for, for something else I was dealing with. And I said, hey, I know these people really well. And I tried to turn in... I, you know, a, a, a lot of material that would be most likely incriminating. 
you know, do you want to do an interview about that or maybe help me get a hold of somebody that might now take it serious? And the email I got back all those years ago was that story is no longer newsworthy, 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 excuse me. So I don't have a lot of insight about how that kind of unfolded. I know that the last time I was there, everything was in disarray. He was very concerned, uh, which I put in the book. There was a, uh, a mention and a discussion about how she wanted to have Jeffrey Epstein killed because she said he was going to be the death of her. So she was entertaining that. And I says, well, considering who you know, you know, we won't say that agency with the M and all these other mm. people they know and the money they have, why would you bring this to me? Unless to do something and then have security details perhaps kill me after the fact. Were you- and so I did not want to get involved with that. Um, but I know at that time there was a lot of disarray and panic going on with her and with him. When this all broke open, were you approached by the authorities? I mean, law enforcement? Were you ever interviewed or talked to? No, not not officially. No, I've mentioned it to a few people that I know, and I think that basically they have enough. And as far as the victim rights attorneys, um, I don't want to sue. I never wanted to sue. I was never looking for a penny about some of the stuff I experienced at the house. You know, being trapped there, being taken advantage of when I was trying to get the hell out of there. Um, I didn't want. I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to say, look, you know, I tried to report this officially the best I could while I was actually a future that I tried to report it. So you can't really walk in and have a conversation at that time. So, so you so, you mentioned um, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, um, which is interesting that she was involved. And there's a lot of talk that Bill Gates is being got divorced because of his connection to Jeffrey Epstein. But again, just clarify for me how you know or believe that they were actually involved. Saw it with my own eyes, heard it directly from Jeffrey. What the circumstances were, why that was going on. It, saw and, it with my own eyes. And in that situation when he sort of thre- not, not 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 live, you know, the video. Uh-huh. And when you, okay, so you saw the video, surveillance video, and when you, when he kind of threatened you, was he more than implying, was he telling you that he has powerful people under his thumb and that you're basically nothing and he could squash you if he wanted to? Is that, was that the intimation? You hit it right on the head. He, really? He made it very, very clear that he always gets what he wants and I need to stop playing, you know with him and something he wanted done was not going to happen. So he wanted somebody else. So in, in somewhere in this world exists video, you believe of Bill and Hillary Clinton of people like Bill Gates of Prince Andrew. There's, you think there's video out there. Someone's in possession of this video. 110%. And there's probably more than one copy of it going around. Carmela. If we got that video, Surviving the Survivor would have 100 million subscribers. And William Steele, I know you have, do you have a podcast yet, William Steele? I think, I think um, we, we, we should. We just started a YouTube channel, mm-hmm. William Steele Author. You go to YouTube, William Steele Author. My website is williamsteeleauthor.com. And there's a couple of other videos that we've done, and we're going to be putting up some more content. Again, I was released from prison. Actually, this month makes a full year that I've been out. Mazel tov. All this is new. <laughs> all this is new to me. I have a brand new, beautiful iPhone. Barely know how to use it. I'm learning how to use social media. I want to tell my stories, and I want to be able to help people. That's my whole objective: is being a victim advocate, working with my fiance. We're a team, and we do this together. And she's got her stories from California, and I have mine. William, you're a sweet guy. Stay out of prison for me. I need to hang out with you in Miami Beach, but. I still have many questions. This one I could go on for hours. I know your time's a little limited, but he, uh, um, what did you make of the? Um, you'll get your chance, Carm. Uh, what uh, yeah. What did you make of the um, Prince Andrew settlement? I mean, that's basically an admission of guilt, right? Well, it's funny in a way. You know, Virginia Gouffre can do whatever she wants, mm-hmm. and 
this. Some people that said that she was actually, as she got older, was actually bringing younger girls to him. So she, you know, assisting authorities now should probably never be charged because she's she's a victim. She's entitled to take that settlement. I know it disappointed a lot of people because they wanted more stuff to come out during the case. But it's ironic that I just did my interview with several media outlets, and the one that's on newsstands right now on the February twenty eighth. Uh, edition. That's the National Enquirer, on, right? Hey, that's right. I'm in the National Enquirer this week. It's uh-huh. on newsstand. Okay. About these videos and about Andrew, but the interview was done before she took the settlement. Mm-hmm. So it literally came out right after the settlement. If they would get their hands on the video, I don't know that there'd ever be a settlement. I, I think Virginia Gouffre would have been living in Buckingham Palace and, you know, <laughs> pretty much owned the royal family. But um, I saw but a picture. I saw a picture of, of, uh, that they said that she had a Polaroid picture that they authenticated, where she, uh, where uh, she uh, she's now in Australia with three children, married, and she 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 had a box of photographs, and she authentic they authenticated the one where she uh, and Prince Andrew who was forty one at the time and she was fifteen, are there. And Ghislaine is standing behind them, very proud of them. If you notice in some of the pictures that have come out, she's right behind a lot of people, smiling like... like exactly, the, uh, like, the madam, the madam, like the madam. Like the madam in the, the bordello. Exactly. Like she's hooking up all these wealthy, super wealthy guys with all these young women and knowing what's going to happen. I, I, have to, gonna I have a question before he cuts me off. Usual She'll sentence. cut you off instead, William. Okay. Let, let people finish their sentence, please. <laughs> no, but, Go on. But I knew where, I mean, it was finished. But um, now, you see, now, uh, one, one second, senior moment. I always get it when he, I'm I'll passing. slip right in here. Here's an interesting <laughs> uh, Jelaine Maxwell fact. She was born, this is, Carmel will have a field day with this as a therapist. She was born two days before a car accident that left her 15-year-old brother, Michael, in a prolonged coma until his death in 1967. The mother later reflected that the accident had an effect on the entire family and that she surmised that Jelaine had shown signs of anorexia while she was still a toddler as a result of this accident. That's pretty crazy traumatic stuff going on there no excuse for what she well, did i'm but. sure she's the last child of nine children and and her father's favorite right did, did you see that anywhere reported but what i wanted to ask i'm also trying to figure out life you know um what would you have done would you have just moved to new hampshire and hope that the the americans don't catch you uh, uh, when when they when this was all going down with with Epstein, or would you have disappeared to South America or Mexico or wherever, and had a little plastic surgery and and disappeared? You know. Well, first first of all, I would have never done what they did, having sex with a bunch of kids. I mean, it's one thing if you're young and you're living out your fantasies, and it's adult. It's another thing when you're, you're these teenage girls and boys you know, that you're doing these things with and then blackmailing famous people. So I would never be in that situation. But if I went on the run and I was her, she specifically told me that if she leaves, she was going to go to France. She had what she called her Polanski plan because she had dual citizenship. She could not be extradited from there. If she made it to France, my understanding is they can never extradite her. If you notice, Jeffrey, the second he flew back in from France, they arrested him in New York, and the regular squad investigating these people, my understanding, they weren't involved. They had a public corruption squad in New York, FBI, investigating them. So that means how many other public officials are going to go down, hopefully, that were involved with these people. It was the public corruption squad that actually picked, picked them up, picked them up. All right, but why didn't invest- this land disappear? Why did she kind of, it's almost like she wanted to be caught? Who knows? Maybe like a deer caught in the headlights. She knew she was caught. She believed, you know, her her uh, her, her yes man, I guess, around her. Maybe her attorneys, oh, don't worry. They would have got you a long time ago. My understanding is they had a deal in South Florida that some of the actual perpetrators helped craft this deal. 
that all known and unknown co conspirators Kennedy. If a lawyer was involved and you helped craft this deal, you're actually protecting yourself and it's plea bargain. What they didn't count for was that deal only count counted for the Southern District of Florida. It didn't apply to New York, the Southern District of New York. So the lawyers are phenomenal lawyers, but they really, you know, misadvised them. So she probably thought she was protected by that same deal. If she could never be charged. So what's ironic and interesting, you're from Brooklyn. She winds up in the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, of all places. And her brother, right. Ian Maxwell, who's 65, says he is terrified for his sister's safety. Should he be, William? Listen, she's got dirt. He knows where the evidence is against a hell of a lot of powerful people worldwide. Uh, my understanding, Saudis, uh, you know, all kinds of people. A lot of that material was given and shared with intelligence agencies. If she talks to get a deal, she might get a deal for 10 years. You know, 10-year deal, tell us everything you know, witness protection. But guess what? Who's not going to who's not gonna recognize her in witness protection? Mm -hmm. You know, she's just so prominent that there's no way she can successfully hide in this day and age with a camera and the internet everywhere. I mean, so even if they gave her a deal and let her out in a few years, I, I think I, think I have another she's, question. She's in danger in prison. She's in danger everywhere. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. You have been in prison, and I know in prison there is some kind of a justice in a certain way. There are certain things that are not tolerated among the prisoners, and they kill the prisoner. So uh, the fact that she would this be like a, a danger? Let's say if she were with the population of prisoners. Would they kill her because she was uh, providing these underage girls? Would they, would this be enough? For, you know, sometimes if they did the in, certain things that they killed them afterwards. In, in my opinion, in a case like hers, if she does make it to prison somewhere, she'll be in protective custody. She still will be extorted and victimized there. But there will be people that come around her, especially the gang members and all that, That'll offer her protection. Hey, just have your family, you know, put 50000 a month on my account until you go home, and you'll be protected. When, they, when it's a wealthy pedophile, they'll let them exist for payment. I got if you. She didn't have the money to pay this extortion once she gets to prison. She's not going to last long in population. Probably not even in protective custody. But because she's got money, so I think if anybody gets to her, it's going to be if she decides to make a deal and turn in what she has, and then it gloves off. They're not going to send inmates to get it. It's going to be staff. It's going to be you know, medical department. It's going to be a drug somehow. I, wow. And there is, was even rumor that you know that the uh, Diana, the 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 mother of uh, William and Harry, was you know it was the it was Win, the Windsor Windsor Castle. The orders came from Windsor Castle. And and now Andrew uh, is compromised. Some orders can come from Windsor Castle also. Is it po is it possible that powerful people are corrupt? Oh no, they've all but, got their the right to pay. Well, the, is, listen. Is there this. a quotation that says absolute power corrupts absolutely? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, this is so we're talking about this sort of you know we're we're digging into it. But if you really step back and you think about this story, I mean, here's a guy who is basically a nobody, a hustler, a street hustler, claimed to make money on Wall Street, was worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and he got this money from people like the Clintons, like Donald Trump. By the way, you ever see Donnie Trump on a video? Don um, Jr.? No, senior. senior. Oh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, uh, well, or, or, jun get into that. or Junior. No, I have my own reasons why I don't want to get into that. Very uh, okay. People okay. I know are very well connected. I, I just can't get into that right now. No worries. No, worries. I understand that in Brooklynese. <laughs> I'll move. <laughs> I'll, I'll move right along. But what's amazing is let, let me let me put it to you this way: When I got engaged, we stayed at Trump International Hotel in Chicago a few weeks ago. So. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So okay. here is what's incredible. Really, not much has come out of this other than Prince Andrew and 
the fact that she got caught and Jeffrey Epstein is dead. I mean, but they all fit in together like a, they fit in together like a puzzle. Yeah, they fit together perfectly, but it's just um it's mind-blowing because the powers that be are really keeping this sealed shut and I don't want to offend anyone watching the show, but Americans are basically dumb morons and believe what they're That's told. That's terrible to say. You should say some Americans. Some, I mean, they believe that this guy was was committed suicide. There's just no way. The same circumstances. I mean, this guy, Jean-Luc, the guards were asleep. The video was off. Epstein's guards were asleep. The video was off. I mean, how dumb do we have to be to believe this? William? No, nobody cares except for the victims and the victim advocates, really, that what happened to them. At the same time, it's my opinion that these various intelligence agencies and governments are manipulating this entire thing. They'll let it play out until they get wind that somebody's going to cooperate, like her. They get wind of that, in my opinion, she will not last long after that. Mm. Even if they try to hide her, you know, I don't think she'll last long after that. You know, true confession, I... Uh, for example, when O.J. Simpson crime, I thought it was like from central casting, and I was much younger, and I really followed it, really followed that story. This story, I kind of sort of went in and out a little. But now, here is, here is what I thought, just logic, logic. Okay, I thought this guy made money hustling rich people and offering them investments and and making money, and then when he was at a certain point, he would also uh, offer them women. Okay, but I now I I am thinking my brain is telling me now that actually from the beginning he was like a pimp, and that this is how he pimped his way through only on a higher level, you know, not on the street level, but on the on the influential people level. And he, he was like a con artist to set himself up into this business. Somebody asked me if I thought he was an asset or an agent um, as far as Jeffrey goes. And I say he was definitely an asset. I think it's pretty, pretty obvious. So He was a convenient, he was a useful idiot for a lot of people. William, how do you think you sort of alluded to this, at least on the Jelaine part, that if she cooperates, she's basically done. But how does this all end? I think if she doesn't cooperate, she's gonna she gets sentenced in a few weeks. I think she's probably gonna end up with twenty or thirty years in prison and you know I don't know. It doesn't look good for anybody in her situation to begin with, let alone She's not going to be in, if she cooperates, she's not hiding from gang members or mob guys who, you know, not going to be able to find them and don't have the wherewithal to really she, she's track the, people down. She's the, uh, you, how are you going to hide from the intelligence agencies? They're all over your internet. <laughs> you know, they monitor voice prints, uh, your movements, your phones. There's no way, even in custody, she can hide from what's coming, in my opinion, if she decides to cooperate. And you I think, think she probably will. I think she'll try her hand and try to cooperate, but I don't think she'll last long after that. And you think this goes, and I don't want to jinx because now we're implicated, Carmel and I, but you think this goes all <laughs> the way implicated. up to- We are a part of the crime. We're part of the syndicate. Finally, I've done something <laughs> exciting in my life. Do you think this goes all the way up th through the intelligence communities who are dealing with this? Yes, he just said Without it. a doubt. That's what, I, said, you know, what that. I said. Okay. Anything more specific than that, you know, I'm not going to say, but that's what I've been saying. It's so dangerous to even talk about. And if she offers up the evidence and who and why, she's not going to laugh. But really, she, she won't be hiding from street gang members or mob guys. She's hiding from intelligence agents. Who's, who's been able to pull that off? But William, <laughs> it's lose lose for her. Lose lose. William? Minute. Didn't the Mossad even get like. Adolf Eichmann and all these yes. characters in South America, they'll spend a lot of money to get people they want to get. William, I may not have gone to locksmithing school, but I just came up with a brilliant idea. You and I host a podcast just about Jelaine Maxwell. <laughs> we'll get a gazillion followers, and the title of the podcast is called The G-Spot, and you and I host. You know what's, 
crazy about that. I don't know if you got broke into my social media or hacked me or something. No. But that was going to be the name of my book. Really? Really? <laughs> Great yes, line. but I thought it was a little, I thought it was a little too flippant because it, it is a serious topic. And uh, so I went with sala- uh, sala- uh, sensational and impure because the judge said the material in the case concerning certain things was too sensational and impure to be released. Wow. I, I used that. Wow. But that was the title. That was the working title of my book. May great minds think, think, great think, minds I think alike. Great minds think alike. Thing, one more thought I had. That even if she came forward. I'm e- sorry? Even if she came forward. Because the actors are so high up that they could disqualify her. In other words, they would say that's just one woman is trying to get out of jail. Carmel, if you don't speak into that microphone and you keep looking away, I am going to have to remove you from this show. Because if you don't speak into a mic, people cannot hear you. Continue. There's something on this end. I don't know how to turn the volume up on this. Oh, sorry. We're we're getting, Carmel. No, you are doing well. I am, I am, next time I want to sit facing that way. We'll fix it for next time. Because we are new in this um, studio. Studio. We are only for the. But sec- what you're, so you're po- Carmela, your point is that these people are so powerful; they're just going to say that she's just a, a whacked out woman. Her. Yes, of course, of course. Okay, I mean, think you- about this. Think about this. They have access to everything under the sun: pharmaceutical, toxins. If she cooperates, who's to say something doesn't get into her system that kills her from a heart attack? You know, the next day, or makes her mentally ill, you know, like some kind of LSD, even, I don't know, something they can give you that would make you out of your mind and they can't use her as a witness anymore. I was just and watching. That, that, something like that can easily be done by corrupting prison or jail staff. I've seen them bring in cell phones, drugs, heroin, uh, uh, suboxone strips, all this stuff. They're corrupted by lowly gang members. Can you imagine how easy it would be for them to insert an employee in those settings that's handing her her food tray. Yeah, I, I've been watching this. Sh- uh, yeah. You, know what, you know what I say, William? That life is like slow loss of illusions. You know, like slowly, one by one, you lo- lose your illusions about the beauty of this or the beauty of that. Yeah, yeah. you, you, you want to you think your best about people and I've been to prison with guys, you, you know, they were, you would never dream to look at them that they were involved with some of the things they were involved with. You can't judge a book by its cover. I mean, all that stuff is just so true. You lose your illusions. You know, you think the best of people. So let me and, ask you a you question. But you really have to be on your guard and just go, I, I you know, I, I do read my Bible and it says something about go through life, you know, uh, uh, wise as a serpent, gentle as a lamb. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to be aware that there are snakes all around us. Interesting. This is what I was going to ask you. In light of your life till now, uh, do you uh, do you feel that you have peace of mind now, or you feel that you still have a little turmoil going on about what? No, happened? I don't. I don't really. Unfortunately, there's a big burden lifted when you finally do get this off your chest, and there's been a lot of support, a, a hell of a lot of support. But no, I don't have peace of mind because I do know that people are turning up dead. And, you know, I just have to face reality that uh, doing the right thing sometimes has a cost. I, th- I think she means, I think she means with your life, do you, do you feel like you've kind of come full circle? Do you feel rehabilitated? Do you feel like you're going to be able to stay out of trouble now? Absolutely. I mean, everybody says that and then they get right back in trouble again, right? Yeah. <laughs> call Carmela <laughs> if you, last- call Carmela if you get the urge, she'll walk you through it. Okay. No, I'm not well, such this, a this saint. Last- don't paint me Carmella, such a saint. Carmela, thank you for asking. But no, this last experience in prison, I lost my mother. She was mentally ill. Uh, my um, Nobody notified me. I don't have contact with my adult children. There's been so much suffering and loss. Um, I just, I've lost so much. There's an expression, the days of darkness is, have caused me to see the light. I realized that that's just a dead end, and I don't want to spend a second longer locked up. So turning it around is far more rewarding than that. I'm not making anything really, you know, to even survive, basically. I'm just getting by, but I also just got released after so long in prison. 
I didn't have a car. I didn't have a computer. I didn't have a phone. Um, you know, I have a TV show, but you know, that doesn't pay till down the line sometimes. But can you tell us a little bit about, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the TV show without telling us too much? Right. My contract says I can't talk about the name of the show, the the title of the show or the network right now Mm -hmm. until they start their own PR Mm -hmm. and putting their own trailers out. But it's on one of the most gigantic TV networks there is. It's a show essentially about my life and reacclimating to society after being in prison so long and my work and being a victim advocate, an author, um, everything that I'm doing, uh, associating with people that I live with and those relationships, how they play out after I've been in prison so long. Well, so it's really tracking my life and my success. But we actually did one of the episodes at a book signing. Barnes and Noble wanted me to do a book signing. But because of COVID, there was restrictions and we had to do it at some little mom and pop bookstore. And so that's actually going to be in the show. But I'm looking forward about. to about it. Rejoining society after but listen, my life. You, you let us know. I mean, don't forget. Don't just say now. Yeah, I let you know. You let us know and we'll watch it. Absolutely. We feel like you are, we are your relatives now. <laughs> and when you're uh when when you're in I appreciate that. that thank you yeah when you're in florida you come visit us in uh miami beach the, the other yeah. brooklyn the other brooklyn yeah. meanwhile I, I used to live in coral, coral springs for lauderdale palm beach i yeah. was all over boca which are you are you italian or irish i'm sicilian and um my i'm sicilian and english sicilian and english See the hand movement. I love it. So William Steele, once again, is the author of the very popular new book, Jelaine, Sensational and Impure. You can order it on Amazon, Jelaine, Sensational and Impure. He's got a YouTube. What's the name of the YouTube channel? William Steele, author on YouTube. Please William- subscribe. And I also remind your viewers to support the victims. And uh, I put this in all my books. I have two books out now. All that's meant for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. That's right. On every level. It's awesome. Edmund Burke. Every level. William, it was great meeting you. Please stay in touch. All right. Thank okay, you. Let right us back know with the news. You guys have a great show and a great dynamic between you two. <laughs> Thanks, Hello. William. Welcome back. It's time for the news schmooze. You know, I got to say, William Steele seems like one of the nicest guys. Like, if I was in a prison cell with him, I'd have a great time, actually. I feel like I'd have a good time with him. We'd just hang, hang out. What do you think? What was your take on him? It's so I crazy think, to me, these people make, that... Uh, they, I, I was surprised that he doesn't know Navia, because they're both very uh, jovial, likable, uh, bright, clever... Criminals. Ex criminals. Ex criminals. But, but this this guy is very Italian, Brooklyn. Yes. And the other is very, very Cuban. Cuban, Miami. Although I But I say, love them both. We both love <laughs> these characters. What? We love them more than any we love more than any yeah. other of the of the normal characters. I don't know. They just William has such a sweet way about him. I mean, I'm sure he's got a, another side that we <laughs> well, haven't seen. He even admits that he used but guns and honestly, he threatened yeah. with guns. But honestly, there is a part of me that is always jealous of this because of their innovative thinking. Made millions of dollars, something I can't say for myself. Joel, he just said that he had hardly any money to buy a car. Well, that's after he got out of prison. But when he was dealing in diamonds. Yeah. On to the new schmooze. Buckingham Palace aides have reportedly rewarded a nursery reworded. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm shaken up over this whole, uh, I can't get over what's going on. But in light of the fact that we were just talking about Prince Andrew, Buckingham Palace aides have reworded a nursery rhyme to mock Prince Andrew, Andrew over his roughly $12 million settlement with former Jeffrey Epstein sex slave Virginia Roberts Geoffrey. Je- no, and it goes like no, this. Okay. The grand old Duke of York, he had 12 million quid. He gave it to someone he'd never met for something he never did. The new spin on the nursery, nursery, nursery rhyme goes. 
The lyrics refer to the disgraced royal's infamous 2019 interview with the BBC in which he claimed to have no recollection of ever meeting Giffray, despite a photo in which he was seen with his arm mean? around the then 17-year-old at a now, a now convicted Madame Ghislaine Maxwell's home. So this stuff is in the news as we speak. Do you believe that such powerful people are this disgustingly corrupt? Very honestly. Yeah. Do you have a hard time? Honestly, do you have a hard time believing I it? I finally, I feel, I learned what what uh, Epstein was all about. I always have illusions still. Like I have to shed more. Because they made it sound like he was like some brilliant investment. Exactly. Exactly. That's my point. Yeah. That that his money he did with 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 uh, like. Uh, Investing and money and it's all sex. I never. I am kind of happy that sex is so important. Sells sex sells, man. He was worth five hundred million bucks. Sex is it, man. So we had uh, the author. By the way, it's better to make love than to make war. This is not with uh, not with um, uh, adolescents, not with teenagers. So we had um, the author who spent speaking of criminals. More than a decade with BTK. I thought this next story was pretty interesting in light of this. Michigan school shooter Ethan Joel, Crumbly. if you don't hurry up, I'm not. He going. shot up a school recently in Pontiac, Michigan. He said that he enjoyed listening to the death squeals of baby birds. He wrote about wanting to rape a female classmate and idolize cannibal killer Jeffrey Dahmer. The new revelations come. From Oakland County Assistant Prosecutor Markeisha Washington dur during a lengthy hearing. In text threads with his friend, he outlined plans to stalk, rape, torture, and ultimately kill a female classmate. Crumbly said he admired both Jeffrey Dahmer and Adolf Hitler because, and this next part, I actually, this next part that I'm going to read, I can actually relate to. Because when you die, you need to be remembered for a long time. I understand that. I feel that way myself. What, what am I going to be remembered for? I have three children. Luckily, I didn't, you know, express it in this manner by killing birds and listening you, to them squeal. Using, using this venue. Using this venue. But I do understand Ethan Crumbly's desire to be known. Other than that, I condemn everything he's done, for the record. On to this last story. This is a... This hits home personally. This is a wild, crazy, really actually shook me up. Conservative media personality Zoe Zozo Bethel. She was crowned Miss Alabama for a pageant known as America Strong. She died days after she fell out of the window of a three-story building, according to the Miami Police Department. She, uh, they responded to a possible suicide attempt on February 11th at 12 a.m., she was later identified as Bethel. What is a 12 a.m.? Midnight. A week later, she died. The cause of her death, death was blunt force trauma. Why is this story so interesting to me? Because I was doing a you report. You told me about it. I was you told me I was doing a report in downtown Miami in an area known as Brickell. And this woman, two weeks ago, two weeks before she was dead, 27, she walked up to me and said, excuse me. I'm trying to be a news reporter. I was with my photographer, Walter, who is better known to me as Chris Rock. He looks and sounds just like Chris Rock, the comedian. And as I was talking to her male friend, Walter was hitting on her unrepentantly. She's a beautiful young woman. She was yes, Miss Alabama, I, I, stunningly pretty and very intelligent. And she said to me, what should I do next about my reporting life? And I said, you know, try this and try this. Two weeks later, dead, gone, forever. And I, I don't think, think she committed suicide. I think. And there's very, a lot of suspicion. There's a lot of suspicious circumstances surrounding this case. Joel, by the way, you should call First the police. First they reported that it was you an You should accident. call the police and tell them about this conversation because this is another proof that she wasn't depressed or suicidal. She was sweet, did not seem depressed. She had recently moved to Miami. She was a very religious girl, woman woman she's 27 and uh wow it really freaked me out um, all right all right let's move on because i'm sorry is it possible that you can be alive two weeks ago and not be alive two weeks later 
even an hour before you can be alive, before you die. May her memory be a blessing and may her family be okay. We'll be right back with three questions for Grandma. It's time now for three questions for Grandma. <laughs> I got to say, of all the three questions for Grandma, and we we got to switch this episode either back to this week and dead and dying at your condo or something. But this has to be the, the way it was. I wish I had it on video like Jelaine has stuff on video because, well, that's how, actually a horrible analogy, but I meant video proof because the way she asked this question was so funny. This comes from ZZ Bugs, my six-year-old who comes in today and says, Ask the following question. And admittedly, I do have an addiction and I have a problem. She says, why does my father say he doesn't eat sugar, but has a pound of peanut M&Ms, regular M&Ms, and a bag of the unwrapped Rolos, which are car caramel filled chocolates, by his bed? Why would he have that if he says he doesn't eat sugar? She caught me red handed. Because he's a liar there. <laughs> Red-handed. Your daddy is a liar. I can't stop eating chocolate, especially at night. Just terrible. That's why. Question number two. You shouldn't keep it there. If you kept it, I know you. You are my son. If you kept it in the kitchen, you would be too lazy to go out there. 100%. There we go. Putting me down again. I'm not putting you down. I am that, like that myself. When we had a two-story place, and the, and, and the bedrooms were upstairs. I looked slimmer because I was too lazy to you go down. put enough pressure on a bowling ball, it will shatter. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Next question comes from Vita Aliyah. thought this was a good question. Perceptive. Why do dogs have hair and not skin? Carmela? But they have skin under the hair, for heaven's sake. And uh, Judah Bear was not available this morning. He was busy drinking his bottle of milk, um, passed out because he was up at three in the morning doing work with me. Uh, so we have a part two from Vita Aliyah. Why do dogs have wet noses, Carmela? I used to know this. Wait a second. You know, I'm curious. I'm going to Google this right now. Carmela, no, what are you? We don't have time because we have we plenty gonna... of time. Why do dogs have wet noses? Why do dogs? I, I think, I think it's. Why See, did, I knew it. I knew it. Why do dogs That's have That's terrible. Wet when you are 82 year old, you forget what you knew and you don't learn anything. And my Wi Fi is crappy in here and it's not loading. Um, okay, why okay. do dogs have we'll wet get, noses? Tune in next week. We'll tell you why dogs have uh, wet noses. And so noses what? secrete mucus. The inner lining of the dog's nose contains special glands that produce mucus to keep the nasal canals moist. A thin layer of mucus clings to the nostrils, enhancing the absorption of scent chemicals and improving the ability to smell. There's another proof that God thinks of everything. Ah, uh, man. Uh, Carm. What do you think of uh, Steel? I still can't get over this. I think we are really lucky. This is an we, awesome story. No, we, no we, are, we are really lucky. We find real, real interesting stories and characters. and Best the, guests in all of podcasting right here on Surviving the Survivor. Arm, any final words? You want to yes. stretch the next eight minutes out? No, I don't want to stretch. I have to run back to the hospital. Tomorrow is the big day. God bless our father, my father, your husband, who's... In the hospital, it'll be all right. God willing. Let's Amir go. Let's go. Let's Love go. you, America. I'm going back to the hospital. Love you, America. Okay, bye. <laughs>